Thank you for tuning in to 1 minute and 43 seconds. The opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly opinions and speculation only. Everyone is considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. If you love this podcast, please consider giving it a 5-star rating or a review on the platform on which you are listening. Welcome to One Minute and 43 Seconds, a true Unsolved Mysteries podcast. And today my guest is the lovely Joanne Lee. Welcome back, Joanne. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me back again. And you know what, Joanne? Mm. This is actually the first episode of 2022. What? Really? Yes. Well, that's exciting. Thanks for being on this year's first episode. Well, thank you for having me. I know we were kind of going back and forth about with our schedules because things have been busy for a time to meet. So glad we actually found time. Um, But I'm really excited about this case, which it's a tragic case, but I'm just really excited because it's very baffling, which is a lot of, uh, I mean, it's an Unsolved Mysteries podcast. So obviously... It's going to be somewhat baffling, but this one is just one of the ones that I've always been very, very intrigued by. So, okay. And go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, well, I'm very excited to to hear all about it. Yeah. And um, you're going in blind. You've never heard about this before. So that'll bring a nice new element to it. Okay. You can react to it. (laughs) Yeah, you can react to it because you'll be hearing it for the first time. Yeah. Okay, great. So today, we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Danielle Imbo and Richard Patron. And they disappeared from Philadelphia in 2005. Damn. So, 16 you, years ago. Exactly. When you think 2005, I mean... And off the top of my head, it's like, oh, that wasn't that long ago. But then when you really start to think about it, it's it's like, yeah, it was it was 16 years ago. Yeah, so. I know. That's that's how I feel about anything that's like in the 2000s, right? I don't know if it's just me, but it's like when you say like, oh, it was just in 2008 or 2002, it's like, oh, that's not that long ago. But no, when you do <laughs> the math, it's like, wait a minute, it's, I'm old, so <laughs> I know what you. Yeah, exactly. Or like if somebody says something happened in 1970. I'm like, yeah, that was 30 years ago. (laughs) It's like my brain can't move move on, move on uh, beyond the year 2000. That's how I feel. (laughs) That's, that's like a really, really good way (laughs) of seeing it. That's kind of how I feel too. Yeah. So anyway, so this is the disappearance of two people. uh, And I showed you their photo just so Mm -hmm. you can put a face to the name. Danielle was uh, 34 years old at the time of her disappearance and Richard was 35. So in order, before we go over the disappearance itself, for this one, I have to give a little bit of backstory so it makes sense and so people can understand why they were together that night and sort of the circumstances surrounding it. Okay. So that's where I was going to start. Okay. Sounds good. And if you see me just like kind of all over the place, I'm just like trying to get some paper and a pen and see if I need to take notes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love it. I love <laughs> that you're so into this. It's great. Okay. So let's start with Danielle Imbo. She was 34 years old in 2005 and she was from Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And at the time of her disappearance, she was separated from her husband. So some some ta- uh, excuse me some facts about her. She was from New Jersey. Um, she really loved to sing, and her father was actually John Atobre was Danielle's father, and he was actually a doo-wop singer in the 1950s. So that I thought was really cool because yeah. she she took after him 
um, right. and his, like his love of singing. And she loved to go out to um, different bars and restaurants and just hear local music. That was one of her favorite things to do. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Her husband, we could talk about that. So Joe Imbo was his name. And that's, this is really where this story begins. So this was her husband. She married her husband. I believe they married in 2002, okay? Uh, and she kind of changed a little bit when they met. Yes, okay, got it. So they married in 2002. Uh, and two years after that, in 2004, they had a son. So Danielle had a son who was about two years old at the time she went missing, okay? Their life changed after they got married. And her husband kind of wanted her to live a more um, low-key life. He didn't like that she was going out to different bars and different uh, places to play music. She thought that since she was a, that she was a married woman that she should be home and kind of taking care of her household and things like that. So Joe's not going to look very good in this because he really wasn't like in love with their new life. He, so in 2004, he had tickets to go to the Super Bowl, right? And mm -hmm. Danielle and her son, her young son, which is Joe Jr., were sick at the time. But instead of staying back with them, he continued and he went to the Super Bowl anyway. So not wow. great, but it gets no. worse. It gets worse because on the plane, he met another woman. And what? when he got back, he told Danielle, basically it was over and that he was leaving her for this woman. And so they started, he, he moved out and he started, he, basically left her for this woman and Danielle was really upset about it. And during this time, she was very, um, very stressed out. She was a smoker, but she was smoking even more. Like she was chain smoking, really stressed out. And then after that, I, I, you know, I promise I'm not going to take too long on the background, but this is all very important. You're good. The relationship didn't last with this new woman and mm -hmm. he ended up moving back. And oh my he, God. <laughs> he wanted to take her back. He wanted her back. And she was very stressed out because they had a child together. Um, but uh, she was also very hurt by his actions. Yeah, no shit. And so they were in the middle of the divorce proceedings and he asks for her back. Wow. The yes. nerve of this guy. So during that time... Danielle was actually seeing somebody else. She had reconnected with an old friend. And that person is Richard mm -hmm. Patron, who was the other person that went missing. Oh. Mm -hmm. Richard Patron, his family grew up in the same neighborhood as Danielle's family did. So they had known each other for years. Mm -hmm. And Richard's sister, Christine, was um, Danielle's best friend. So oh, she wow. had known Richard growing up and they were kind of interested in each other when they were younger, but nothing ever happened. Um, mm -hmm. So it was during this time where she was going through this messy divorce that he, um, they were kind of seeing each other. So a few things, a few other things about um, Joe, her ex-husband, husband kind of still. Well, first, let me talk about Richard. So more about Richard. He was, um, came from an Italian family. He was a baker. He worked, oh. um, yeah, so he worked at a bakery that, I think it was called Viking Bakery or something like that, but it was, um, it was in Ardmore, which I guess is close to Pennsylvania. But it was a family bakery, and he took over the bakery uh, and was continuing on the family business. So... <laughs> Um, he loved sports. He loved NASCAR. He loved football. And he really, really liked Danielle. And Aww. he was really happy to be reconnecting with her. That's cute. Yeah. But Joe, her ex slash estranged husband, was not happy about this, even though he had 
basically abandoned her right and then came back you know he didn't necessarily want to be with her but he did not want her to be with anyone else hmm and i'm not trying to taint this uh narrative at all about what could have happened to them because it's just it's very mysterious but yeah it's important backstory okay yeah and i don't i i don't think you're tainting it well for one it's information and for two don't they usually say that like you know when um someone goes missing or is murdered or something usually they like look at the spouse first (laughs) yes that's very true the spouse is always suspect number one yeah so now we're getting it we're getting to the disappearance i think i've kind of covered enough backstory maybe some more stuff will come up the night of february 19th 2005 danielle was hanging out with christine so if you remember christine is richard's sister And they were kind of having like a girl's night with their moms. So Danielle and her mom, Christine and her mom, which is also Richard's mom, they were having like a a girl's night and they were just really, this shows you how close the families were. But so they were really just enjoying themselves. Well, Christine got a call from her brother, Richard, and said, I'm out with some friends do you want to come out and have a drink? And she had to work the next day, but she posed the um, the question to Danielle. I know one thing I forgot to mention. So she's seeing Richard on and off. And Joe has just asked her, this is like late 2004. Joe has just asked her to get back with him. Mm. She's really stressed out. She doesn't know what to do. And so she told both of the men, she told Richard and she told Joe, I don't want, I want to take a break from both of you guys and just focus on my son and my life. Oh, good. Good for her. So they left her alone. And mm-hmm. even, even though it bothered Richard because he really liked her, he respected her wish, uh, wishes and then um, push her. Okay. okay. That, was the, that was the other thing in late 2004. <laughs> Fast forward to February 19th, 2005. Richard, or I'm uh, sorry, Danielle and Christine are hanging out with their mothers. Richard contacts his sister and says, do you want to come, come out for a drink? Christine can't or doesn't feel like it because she has to work. And so she asks Danielle. Danielle says, you know what? I haven't gone out in a while. I really want to see some, you know, i And by the way, they shared custody, her and her ex-husband, they shared custody of their young son. And the son was with their dad that weekend. She figured, you know what? I don't have my son. I have nothing else to do. Why not just go out? Mm -hmm. So Christine drops Danielle off in downtown Philadelphia to meet up with Richard and some other friends who are getting dinner. After they're finished with their meal... Richard says, I'm, I'm going to meet some other friends at this other place. Do you want to come with me there? We're going to see some live music. Hmm. So the place you look, you look like perplexed. Can I further explain anything? No, I just, um, no, no, I, okay. I, I get it. I was just kind of like, wow, this guy's like Mr. Popular or something. He's like, oh, I'm going to hang out with this group of friends and then, like, two hours later, he's like, I'm going to hang out with this group of friends. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, this was a Saturday, I should, I guess I should say. So. Okay. Um, Not a weeknight. <laughs> no, no. Um, so, they went to a place called Abilene's Bar and Restaurant. And that's located at 429 South Street in Philadelphia. So, this is apparently, like, um, or at least it was at the time. Not sure if it still is, but at the time it was pretty much like a really poppin' place for people to go. It was very crowded, a lot of people around, a lot of bars, a lot of restaurants. So um, they go, they have a great time with these with these friends, uh, and Danielle and Richard are starting to really feel close again. And friends were even saying like they caught them kissing a couple times, and oh. so yeah, so they were having a good time. But around 1130, they decided that they wanted to call it a night because 
Danielle actually had um, a hair appointment the next day with Christine, who oh. apparently did hair. Oh, so okay. She had an appointment. I forget what time it was. I think it was like 10 something. She had an appointment to get her hair done. And then also later in the afternoon, Joe, her ex-husband, was going to be dropping off their son for her mm -hmm. to, for them to exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And then Richard also had plans the next day. He said he was going, I believe he was going to watch the NASCAR race. He was going to have oh. some friends over to watch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Danielle wanted to get some rest and call it a night. So at about 1130, they left together with the... I read one source that said like that either Richard was going to spend the night with Danielle or Danielle might spend the night with Richard, but all the other sor some other sources said that he was just driving her home. Mm. So I'm not really sure exactly what the plan was, but anyway, they were going back and Danielle lived in South New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so they leave around 1130 and Richard was actually bragging not bragging, but kind of boasting to his friends, like, oh, I found this amazing parking spot. I don't have to walk very far. And he drove <laughs> a big, like, truck. It was like a Dodge Dakota, I want to say. So they're le they leave at 1130. Apparently, he parked close by, although he didn't tell his friends exactly where that was. Hmm. Um, and it was kind of cold that night. It was, like, in the 20s. So that's why he was excited that he found such a good parking spot, Okay. Anyway, so they leave, his friends enjoy the rest of the night, see a couple bands, whatever. So the next morning, when the first sign that something was, was off, um, Danielle's brother, John, John Jr., went to her house, her, her apartment, and the reason he was there is because her son, when he was playing around or something, like pulled down a curtain rod or something, Oh, wow. So Danielle mm -hmm. had mentioned this to him and he said he would come over to fix it. Mm -hmm. So he showed up and Danielle was not there. Like he's knocking on the door. Nobody's, nobody's answering. So what, what time was that around? Do you know? Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't say exactly what time. Oh, that's fine. So I, I want to say it was sometime like nine or something in the morning. Cause I think her hair appointment was like a 10 something. Oh, okay. He calls, um, he calls up his mom, I believe, who was with her the night before, because remember, they were right. having this girls' night. So the mom says, oh, you know, I haven't heard from her, but I know she went out with Richard last night. So maybe she's with him and stayed over at his place. Mm -hmm. So her brother's like, oh, okay, that's probably where she's at. So he just, he has a key, like a spare key to her house. He just lets himself in and fixes the the curtain rod. Oh, and okay. when he's in there, he notices the bed. I mean, I, I forget, like it looked like Danielle hadn't been there. So like she was okay. a smoker uh -huh. she didn't have like her ashtray out. Like, mm -hmm. so it looked basically, it made sense. She's like, Oh yeah. He, he, or he was like, Oh yeah. She probably stayed with Richard. So right. he, he um, fixes the curtain rod and then leaves. So the next thing, obviously, I think you know where this is going. Danielle doesn't show up for her hair appointment with Christine. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where people started raising an eyebrow because that's oh, absolutely. weird. This wasn't like her. She would always call if she was going to be late for anything. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I should also say they were trying to call Danielle and her phone was going to voicemail. Hmm. I don't remember what kind of phone I had in 2005, but it wasn't like a smartphone for sure. So No, definitely not. Yeah. And because Christine knew that Danielle was out with her brother, he tried calling him as well, and he wouldn't answer. Hmm. So very strange. Um, but again, they weren't panicking at that point yet. They're trying all day to get a hold of Richard, too. And Richard's mom, you know, they were very close. And Richard would, like, call her every day. Oh, and so, uh -huh. yeah, when they were just really tight like that. And when Richard was not responding to his mom or answering any of his calls, she ended up calling a family friend who lived close to where Richard lived. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Richard lived above the family bakery. Oh, okay. So, okay, gotcha. She called uh, her, his mother called a friend that was in the area 
and this or a family of I don't remember a family member the family member goes to his place above the bakery and is immediately concerned because she can hear his dog barking oh like, like the dog sounded distressed like the dog needed to go out yeah and he he was not there so that's when they start to worry so the family members all met up at Danielle's apartment, like his brother or Danielle's brother, John, uh, Richard's mother, they, Christine, they got together mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, this is, this is weird. But I think this is when the panic was starting to set in because at three o'clock, Joe, the husband shows up with the son because they were supposed to switch, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so Joe shows up with the little kid and was like, where's Danielle? And at the time, Danielle's brother, John, you know, because the divorce was kind of messy, he didn't want to mm -hmm. give Joe any information. He just mm -hmm. wanted to, like, cover for his sister. Oh. So he said, yeah, oh, she's out with Christine. Christine wasn't there. I thought she was. But he said, she's out with Christine, and she just asked us to be. When Joe came to the house with the baby, he had, he was surprised to see me and my mother and a couple other people answered the door and Danielle wasn't there. And he had asked where Danielle was and I had made something up quickly. I, I think I said something along the lines of, oh, she's out with Christine and she asked us to be here for her. I didn't know what to do at that point. I didn't know, I honestly didn't know where she was. At that point, I didn't think there had been any type of foul play. I was just trying to cover up for her. Okay. Because I get the sense that he didn't want to be like, oh, we don't know where she is because he didn't want like Joe to use that against her, like think she's a bad mother for not showing up for her son. Right. Because right. it sounded like their their divorce was messy in the way that Joe might pull some something like that and be like, yeah. well, she's a bad mother. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's just the way I interpreted it. Anyway, so right. Joe drops the, the son off, Joe Jr., with his uncle, her brother. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so by later that night, they're, they call the police. They're like, now something's really wrong because they're not here. Nobody can get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. So then what they do is Richard's father and Danielle's brother drive. They just spend the night driving around mm -hmm. between um, the bar that they were last seen at and their house. And they keep driving all around any route they could think of to see if they can um, spot the car. Because the car is also missing, by the way. Their vehicle is gone. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was the wondering huge about that. truck. Okay. Yeah. The huge truck. So um, they drive around, they drive around, and obviously they can't find any trace of this car. Mm -hmm. And so there were a few other things that I'll, we'll talk about the theories and stuff, but... A few other things before this, but fast forward, nothing has ever been found of these two people. And to this six, day? To this day, they've never found a cell phone. They've never found his vehicle. Has got his, they never found his car. And they never found her or him. Nothing. It's no activity. like they disappeared. Yep. Like midair, like disappeared. Yep. No, um, no cell phone like no activity on their cell phones, no bank account activity, just nothing. Okay. Hmm. So a few other details. They did some digging and they discovered that Joe, who was, let's talk about first, of course, because they look at the husband first, right? Yes. Joe had an alibi that was purportedly rock solid. Hmm. He was with his son at a family party 50 miles away that night. Okay. Really? Yeah, I know you're skeptical, right? So yeah. he was there. It gets, it's, yeah. Trust me, we'll, we'll get to the theories. But <laughs> so he was at a family party and apparently all these people could vouch that he was there 50 miles away that Saturday night with the sun. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But they did find something a little unsettling they dug back into like they interviewed obviously all the family and 
everything else. And they found that Joe had called Richard at the bakery and threatened him because he found out that the, the two of them were seeing each other. And this was during the time that things were really stressing Danielle out. When he came back from leaving this other woman and wanted Danielle back, and Richard was kind of seeing her on and off, kind of friendly, but kind of something more. Anyway, so Joe apparently called the bakery a few different times and would like threaten Richard. Another thing I heard about Joe was that there were some fights with Danielle and nothing has ever been reported as far as domestic violence. Like there were no police calls or anything like that, that but apparently he was heated in an argument once and threw their little son's height chair against the wall because he was, he was so upset that she was seeing this guy. Not so surprised. That's not a good, good look, right? Mm-mm. But that's about as far as any sort of like indication goes with the husband. So he has an, an alibi, right? So there's that. And then they really dug into their lives like to see if they were involved in any, anything illegal or anything sinister. And they mm-hmm. couldn't find anything. Like they couldn't find any like gambling debts. They couldn't find anything like that where, where like, oh, this is a red flag. Mm-hmm. These people just left and then boom. So I think that's I think that summarizes pretty pretty much most of the details if we want to talk about theories. Yeah, I would love to hear some of the theories because this is really bizarre. Yeah. Um, hmm, yeah. Tell me what those are and then we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll see if, you know, any of those well, make let's, sense. Let's start with the fact that the year before they went missing, because they went missing in early 2005. So I think in 2004, there was something like 13,000 stolen vehicles in mm. Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So one of the theories is that they were a target of this like vehicle theft ring where they were forced. So for the listeners, Joanne's making a perplexed face, kind of like she doesn't buy it. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm skeptical of that. Me too. And the reason being, I'm sure, hopefully you, I'll let you speak for yourself, but my reason being skeptical of that is you're going to go through the trouble of killing two people to get a car. I mean, it, no. for them to do this on South Street, which was apparently very busy, mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense. Like why? And then why would you pick somebody that's, it's like Richard was a big guy. Okay. Oh, okay. Why, yeah, why I saw the picture. Pick, why would you pick him and somebody else? Why not target somebody who's alone? That's number one. Number two, where are their bodies? How are you going to dispose of two people just for a car? That's number exactly. two. And number number three or four, I can't remember which one I'm on. I've had a lot of tea today. But <laughs> you were at number. Yeah, yeah. So there's the issue of attacking two people on a busy street. And what are you going to do with the bodies? It's not super easy to just dispose of two people without anyone seeing you. And then the final point I was going to make is if somebody did this to steal the car, where the hell is the car? Mm -hmm. Because it's never been found. Right. So my thoughts on that is very similar to that, right? Like, if I don't know about this whole vehicle stealing ring or whatever I don't know what generally these people do but I mean if they're there to like steal vehicles they're not there to kill people Mm -hmm. when they're gonna like when people are trying to steal vehicles they usually steal vehicles when nobody's in the vehicles right so like exactly like that wouldn't that doesn't make any sense to me and that that I'm not I don't buy that (laughs) personally I really don't because Like, also with the vehicle, it's like, do we know the license plates? You know, do we know, like, whatever? Like, I... We do know the license plates. And they never found the license. I mean, so with the license plates, like, you know, if something, like, if they were a target of something or whatever, then I can see that people would take the license plates off, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time they would have been able to identify the vehicle based on what the vehicle looks like. And then they would target all of those vehicles that look exactly like that. 
and they still mm-hmm. weren't able to find it. So yeah, I don't, I don't buy that <laughs> at all. Yeah. No. And I, I don't buy it either. I also think if somebody's going to, let's say somebody's waiting to attack you and remember Richard was talking about he, how he got such a nice parking spot. Right. So he's not far. So he's not far. Vehicle. And you know, nobody saw anything. Nobody remembers seeing them. Um, and if somebody was going to abduct two people, it just seems very sketchy that that would, you know, it just doesn't seem right. So let's move on. I think we've established that one's not really sitting right with us. The other theory, another theory, um, there are, I believe, three bridges that go from Philadelphia out of the city. And if you remember, Danielle lived in South Jersey. I think I want to say it was like a 30 minute drive and I'm probably, if I get these wrong, I apologize, but I'm pretty sure it was like a 30 minute drive. One of the theories was that maybe they were in an accident and they drove off and the car is in a river or something like just sunk. Right. And so that's part of the reason why Richard and Richard's father and Danielle's brother went out driving around and, trying to um, find, spot the car. Mm -hmm. And something crazy actually did happen. They found a car, I believe in the Delaware River, which is what the the bridge they would have to cross, okay? Mm -hmm. They found a car in the river that was like the same kind of, it was a black Dodge like car. But I think, so... They called the families and told them that they found this car when they were searching the river and it was submerged, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. The car had different license plates. Oh. Which is crazy. It was the same kind of truck, but I think it was like, it was like a Dodge Ram instead of a Dodge uh, Dakota. And right. So the license plate was different and they did, they did, um, a check of the VIN number just to, you know, be definitely sure that it wasn't their car and it was a different VIN number and the owner showed up and like said, that's my car. So oh. it gave them some hope. Um, I had family members that were Camden police officers that were at the scene and they had called me from there explaining that I'm here. It's not the truck. I'm here with the owner. It's a Dodge Ram. It's not a Dodge Dakota. A lot of people do believe that the car is, it's possible the car is submerged somewhere and it just hasn't been found. Hmm. Personally, I think that that's likely. Yeah. I don't know the science behind like, you know, sinking vehicles. Yeah. (laughs) So I can't speak too much to that. But if I were to... Like, I feel like, uh, I don't know, there's, there's just, like, there's information, but I don't really feel like there's, like, a lot of information in terms of what could have possibly happened, Mm -hmm. because, I mean, who knows, like, I don't, is one of the theories that maybe, like, um, Danielle's ex-husband, like, might have hired someone to kill them? (laughs) That that certainly is a theory. (laughs) Because I, because, like... I mean, because it's, to me, it's like, okay, yeah, because it's like, okay, if they drove off a bridge and the vehicle sank, then one, the vehicle should have shown up somewhere if they did, like, search whatever, you know, or it, like, flowed through, you know, some, somewhere else or whatever, they would have found that, right? Um, And then the other thing is, I get that it's like really freezing there at the time because it was like mid February. So if there was like ice, black ice, whatever, and then they actually like swerved off or something like that, I feel like that information would have been out in the public as well. But I don't remember really hearing that. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. based on what you're telling me. So it doesn't really seem like that was even mentioned, you know, or like that was. They searched the river. Let's, let's, yeah, I should clarify. They did searches of it and they could not find. 
the, yeah. the vehicle. So that's like, that's weird to me, you know, like it, it seemed, it seems like a lot of steps have been taken to make sure that these two people in the vehicle are gone completely. You are thinking just like the FBI because the FBI made a statement that they, they believe again, I forget what year this happened in, and I'm going to kick myself. I'll put a timeline online with all these specific dates. But you all get the gist of it. The uh -huh. FBI actually came out, came out and said they believe this was a murder for hire plot and they suspect foul play. Now they're not naming the husband. Right. But they've course. said they have not cleared him and they have not cleared anybody because they have, they just don't have the information. Okay. Mm. They actually gave Joe a lie detector test and they never released the results of it. Like they never told the public if it was, if he failed or passed. Now, a lot of people don't trust lie detector tests and yeah. they're not admissible in court because they're not reliable. No, I mean, not. but anyway, that's just one thing. And I read something somewhere where the detective said something to Joe, like, I don't believe that you did this, but I believe you know who did. The FBI, yeah, the FBI has been quoted as saying it's very clean. Yep. Because, and I also heard something interesting. There are these places, or there was like a, there's like these machines that will crush cars up. Oh, yeah. And there's like a shady, there's like shady places apparently where, you can just take these cars and give people like 500 bucks and be like, destroy this. Yep. It just gave mm -hmm. me chills. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I was, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was what I was thinking too. Like it's, it's, I don't, I don't believe that this is like, you know, like this disappearance is due to like natural causes because if that were the case, they would have found something. What the hell is a natural, you mean like driving off the road or something like that? Yeah. Or, you know, like. Like an that's, accident? Yeah. Exactly. Like, that's what I mean. Um, because they would have been able to find something, you know, they would have been able to find evidence of that having happened, you know, like they would have, they would have had breadcrumbs that would lead them to that. But I mean, after 16 years and like nothing like that doesn't, I don't think that that's because of that at all. I, I personally, I do think that the hus the ex-husband hired someone to murder Here's them. my problem. But, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. The only thing I was going to add is, but how would he have known exactly. that they were going to be together? You took the words out of my mouth. That was exactly oh. <laughs> what I was going to say. Yeah. No, that's, we're thinking the exact same thing because that's one of the things that um, has puzzled a lot of people because if it was a murder for higher plot, they couldn't find anything in their, in their past or in their like personal lives that would get them into trouble. Like they didn't gamble, you know, they didn't like, they didn't like owe money to people. Well, so, I don't know. Like with that, I guess it's like, to me, it's like, I don't think that Danielle would have needed to have that kind of background in order to be murdered. No. Because like, I think, you know, like in my mind, it's kind of like, well, if the ex-husband, you know, is, is going through a really like nasty divorce with, you know, Danielle and, you know, he may want to take custody of the kid or, like, you know, just, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I oh, feel yeah. like I meant he would. I meant outside of oh. Joe. They didn't have anything, like, anything else that would really put them as a target that we could yeah. tell is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know about that one either. Because then you would think that, like, you know, Joe would have been the target, not Richard. What do you mean? Oh, no, knows? I'm saying, what I'm saying is, when I was saying the stuff about the gambling debt, like, they didn't have anything that put a target on them. I, yeah. I was speaking about outside of Joe's and Danielle's relationship. Oh. So one of the theories is that maybe Joe had something done to her, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just saying... They couldn't, like, there's nothing I could see in the evidence that would make them a target of a murder for hire plot outside of if Joe were to do it, you know? And I don't want to say, oh. you know, that's what I was trying to say. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah. But I'm with you. So that's what's crazy to me. And 
let's talk about that because this was, these were last minute plans. Yeah. Literally Richard called his sister to hang out. And then his sister told uh, Danielle and then his sister dropped Danielle off downtown. Right. So they, it's almost like if that were the case, they would have needed to be followed. Exactly. So what is it then? Like, I want you to follow this man. I want you to follow, or you, I want you to follow my wife or, or, or this guy until they're together. Or is mm-hmm. it like maybe was Richard the target and then Danielle just happened to be there? What are the chances? You're shaking your head. I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think it's follow this, follow someone until they're together. You know, because the uh, the other unknown is we don't know if Joe knows that she wasn't seeing either of them. So Danielle told Joe, you know, she, she needs to take a break. You know, she doesn't want to see him at, right now. But we don't know if he knows that she said the same thing to Richard. Or That's do true. We? Not, nothing that I've read. I don't know that if either of them knew. Right. So then the other question I would have is where were they at with the divorce? I know like the only thing we know was that it was, it was at, not at a good point. It was nasty. You know, like he was dropping their son off at her place because he had custody um, over the weekend when she was out. But I mean, you know, I guess, cause I guess like the other thing could be that, um, it got to a point where it was like, okay, he wasn't going to win. He wasn't going to get anything out of it or, or, to, or, you know, anything being like, you know, going his way. So he might have hired someone to kill her. Um, and then just that night, like Richard just happened to be there. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just a guess at this point. But I, it is a guy, I, yeah, it's yeah, just speculation, like, I, which is what we do here. On yeah, one minute and forty three seconds. <laughs> but I do think that, like, you know, it's more like a hire. Um, you know, someone someone was hired for yeah. this to happen. That's kind of that's my thought on that. Now they did investigate a few um, a few criminals that. Hmm. They thought maybe, again, I feel so ill-prepared, but there were there was a guy that they looked into that, like, murdered somebody in February, and then he murdered, or March, and then murdered somebody in April in the Philadelphia area. I don't know hmm. that they have much of a connection. Anthony Rodesky. Okay. Um, March and April, that very same year, he was convicted of killing. Killed a couple of folks, yeah. right? Um, had... Uh, was he somebody who was looked at? Absolutely. And it was a couple of months after February 19th. Um, when we went through his home uh, on another, a couple of occasions. He was, is, or a person of interest. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did the proper, you know, follow up. Uh, and again, I haven't ruled out anybody. I don't, I don't really buy it because yeah. it's like, what's the motive? Um, if the motive is robbery, you know, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Well, if it were robbery, then why would they not have been able to find anything at all? Like, that's my biggest thing about this. Like, there's, if it were like an accident, here's the thing. If it were an accident in any way, shape or form, whether it's them, you know, driving off a bridge or, you know, robbery um, at gunpoint, whatever it is, right? Then they would have, like, it... I mean, 16 years later, we would have found something. But this is you like... You would think. You would think. But it's, you know, like to me, it seemed it seems very thought out. Like it was right? meticulously planned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if it wasn't meticulously planned, how could they not have found anything at all? Like nothing, you know? Like that, that's the part that doesn't make sense to me. Well, a lot of people believe that it's possible that 
this is another element of this. So they were drinking that night, but his friends didn't say like, oh, he was really drunk or he was too drunk to drive. Again, he mm-hmm. was a big guy, right? Mm-hmm. So some people think maybe he was a little more drunk than people thought. Maybe he, mm. you know, he's driving on these roads in the night at nighttime and they drive into the river and the car sinks mm-hmm. and that's it. And it's just been concealed. So a lot of people think it's sitting in the bottom of the of the river somewhere and it's just like it's just sunken down. I mean, well, I, I'm not saying I believe that, but I, I right. just that is what some people believe and they think that's the most likely thing. Right. I get you. But like, didn't you say that, that they did do a search in the river? Like they, they searched. Did search the river. They looked, you know, I, I think it was, uh, yeah, they went up in a, they actually went up in a helicopter to like over the river. Oh to see, yeah. Like, to Oh, see. can they spot anything like right. down below? Like that looks weird. Or this car, there's a car, I mean, like see if they could see the car and they couldn't see anything. Right. And I mean, rivers aren't deep, so they would be able to see something from up above, generally. Um, you know, they'd be but able like to see But like if it's underwater, wet. if it's submerged in water, if it's underwater. Well, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, there's different factors, I think, right? Well, for one, if the river isn't very deep, they'd definitely be able to see it. Mm-hmm. If it's, um, you know, not super murky, I feel like they would at least be able to see the silhouette of like a large vehicle, you know, mm-hmm. in the water. Because... Yeah. And it was huge. That's another thing. It's a big ass truck. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like, to me, like, I don't, I don't know. You don't want to flat out accuse the ex. You don't want to, I don't want to sit here and be like, yeah, he definitely did something. He's a murderer. Because he's a he's you know innocent until proven guilty. If there was any evidence, I you know I think the police may have something that we don't know because they they did come out and say we believe this was a a, a planned plot. That's what it seems they, like to me. They actually said, "quote People know." Do you believe, as Christine said, that yeah. people know? Mm-hmm. Yes. Somebody knows, or you think people know? So I'm wondering what they have that makes them say that because they're not just going to come out and say that as a guess, right? right? They can't just... Right. No, I think, I feel like, I mean, you know, I, this is my own opinion, right? But just knowing that um, when you're going to be making a message like this to the public for whether it's like authority figures, the government, like whatever, they don't want to spread like, lies or like you know mass panic and things like that Mm -hmm. right so I feel like for them to have made that statement they really did have something for me for them to say that but they don't have I I don't I don't even want to think that it's like evidence that they have like a hundred percent because if they had evidence a hundred percent and it was like really like gearing towards like okay this is the suspect and this is like who who really did it they would have arrested that person already. Right. Right. Like they don't have but, enough to arrest someone, but they have right, exactly. something. Exactly. They have all of the stuff that's pointing in the direction and they know that for certain, but they don't have the evidence that said, okay, this is really what's happened. And this is the person who did it. And now we're going to go make an arrest. Like that's, that's kind of the way that I see it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I feel like they definitely do have something, but they can't say what it is so that, I mean, you know, you don't want to dirty whatever it is that you've got. You know, you don't want all that information out there for people to, you know, do whatever with or mm-hmm. try to like, you know, clean that up, whatever it is. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm with, I'm like, I'm, I'm on the same page with them on that. <laughs> like, I do think that it's planned in some way. When I was describing Richard earlier, I forgot to mention he himself had a 14-year-old daughter. Oh, really? She was, four, I believe, 14 years old at the time that he went missing. And wow. he it was from a previous relationship. And I believe they shared custody. Or if they didn't share custody, I think Richard had primary custody of her. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe she was, like, visiting her, her mother or something over that, that time. 
that they went missing. Do we know how long um, it's been since they have had a divorce? Up to the point where, you know. I want to say it was like his early 20s. I could be wrong that he, he never married the woman that he, yeah, he never married the woman. It was like a girlfriend or something. And Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard, I haven't heard her talk, talked about too much. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I just bring that up because I forgot to mention, I mentioned the, you know, Danielle's son, Mm -hmm. but you know, her name is Angela. Richard's daughter and she's like 30 now and she has her own yeah. kids. And so wow. she's really heartbroken and she, she's adamant. She's like, she knows her. Cause that's, that's another theory that these two were in love and they, um, Danielle had a, a pet, like this messy divorce and she just wanted to get away from it all. Cause she was stressed. So another theory is that they ran off to start a new life. I don't believe it either. And, you know, I I have a hard time. There's very, (laughs) very few cases where I actually believe that. I feel like it's, it's, it's always brought up no matter what. It's like, oh, they found this woman. Um, They found, found her, like they found blood stains and um, all her person, her money and her passport and all of her clothes were left in her house and there were blood stains and the door was forced open yeah, she she maybe ran off to start a new life. <laughs> like, no, she did not. But I feel like it's always brought up. And I agree. Yeah, it's, sometimes it looks, it could look, you know, people have done that before. Yeah, I'm sure people have done that before. Like, I don't doubt that at all. But with this case, I don't believe that that's the case. Because... Yeah, I just don't believe that that's the case. Like, nothing in any of what you told me points... To that direction. I mean, it's a it's a spur of the moment thing. You know, it was a last minute. But well, they don't plans. need money. They don't. Right. They don't need money. Like they haven't touched anything in their bank account. They don't have like cell phones, whatever. They have. They have kids of their own. They love their like kids Danielle. Too, by the way, right? Like Danielle has like a two year old son. Like she's gonna leave him. Like I just don't. I don't believe that at all. I just figured I would spit that out because that is always one of the theories yeah and i don't yeah absolutely i don't doubt that not buying not (laughs) buying it at all i know that my father loved me more than anything he would have never left me danielle would have never left his son all we need is that little piece of information that could glue everything together so we can get justice and you know someone can pay for what they did to our family they were interviewing christine who is richard's sister if you remember Mm -hmm. and also danielle's best friend Mm -hmm. And she said something really interesting that stuck out to a lot of people. So at the time of Danielle's divorce, Christine was actually going through a divorce of her own. So Danielle would come over to her house all the time and they would drink wine and just talk and talk about their divorces and like everything that was going on. So Christine knew a lot about what was going on. So at that time when she was going through the divorce with Joe, you talked about that a little bit, right? Her and I? Yeah. Every day. And what were those conversations like? I mean, I don't really want to say. It, it was it was hard. She had a lot of struggles with it because of her son. He was little. I mean, he was, I don't even think he was two at the time. Um, so I think she had a lot of struggles with her decisions because of him. I, I knew by that night, I thought I'm never going to see them again. Like, What made you so sure? Just because I, that's what I thought. Because it was so out of character for both? So out of character and yeah, I'm not going to say why I thought it, but I kind of knew. So I'm thinking they're talking about the divorce all the time. She's saying she doesn't want to say is it because she knows mm-hmm. something that Danielle confided in her something? Again, this points to the, the ex-husband, but again, I don't want to sit here and accuse this innocent person who's, or this person who is, there's no evidence, you know? Mm-hmm. So I thought That's I just interesting. thought it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, but see what she said is so vague 
that anybody who already has anything in their mind about what could have happened, that is what people are going to actually think, right? So if there's going to be person A who's like, oh, they totally just like left together, you know, and then this person heard what Christine had said, they'd be like, oh my God, see, I knew it. Like she basically already admitted that they just like left together. That's but then a if, great like, there's, point. You know, like if there's like people like, you know, person B who's like, oh no, like this is way too clean. Like, you know, they were, someone was hired to kill them, blah, blah, blah. Then they like, you know, they hear what Christine had to say. Then, th then they would be like, I, I knew it. Like, you know, because of the messy divorce, it has to be the ex-husband. You know, it's like people cling on to different things that people say based on what they already have in their head. So I don't really think that that really points us into any direction other than what, indi what each individual person already thinks about that might have happened. And That's that really kind of just point. like further um, affirms what they believe. Yes, so confirmation I, I, bias. Exactly. So I completely just kind of ignore that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So that's basically where we are, Joanne. I mean, that's the case of Danielle Imbo and Richard Patron. Um, that's a very interesting case. Joe Imbo Jr., Joe Jr., is God. So if he was two in 2005... He's like he's 18. 18 years old. Um, after this all happened, Joe moved out of state, I think, to like North or South Carolina. Anyway, he, he got custody of uh, Joe Jr. But from what I've read, um, Joe is still a part of Danielle's family. Like he visits um, his, his uh, uncle, her brother, and his, her, um, Danielle's brother has kids. And so they chat online, mm -hmm. you know, so she, he's been like, he's, he's been communicating with Danielle's family still. Oh, um, as in, as in Joe Jr. or Joe? Joe Jr. The kid. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. I just remembered two other things. Can I say them? Yeah. Other details. One, a psychic called up. Uh, I don't know how this all happened, but I think a psychic like told the family that like Danielle's brother, somehow a psychic got in touch with him and said something like, your sister's being held in a boxcar train and you need to act now or she'll die. And so this was like midnight and he jumps in his car and calls the police on the way and says, I just heard this from this person and I'm going to go look at it. And, you know, either you're going to help me or you're not. And they're like, that's a really bad idea. This could be a, <laughs> it is. This could be a setup. <laughs> you could be killed yourself. Don't do it. But he did it anyway. So he, midnight, oh, God. <laughs> he goes into this train yard, abandoned train yard, and he's searching through these boxcars for his sister. Nothing ever came of it. So I don't know what that tip was, and but that's just something I just remembered. And another thing that I was going to say, which is quite sad, is over the years, Danielle's family and Richard's family do not speak anymore. What? Because as the investigation went on, you know, as they're desperate to, like, find their loved one, each of them were blaming the other side for maybe not necessarily blaming, but either each side was pointing fingers at the other side saying, maybe this is the reason that the, they're missing. So for example, you know, Richard's family is saying, well, Danielle's the one that was going through this divorce, this messy divorce and had all this drama, you know, it has to be something in her past that's, you know, caused this. And then on the other hand, they're like, well, what was R Richard's story? What was he doing? Was he involved in some... Basically, they were just kind of like getting to the point where they're like speculating. And so now they don't speak anymore, which is, it's very sad. And I don't know that if that's very changed sad. at all, but yeah. That's very sad. And also like, 
like, I get it, you know, in a situation like that, when you don't have any control, where you don't know what happened, you want to have some sort of control to, and, you know, to blame that this happened, you know, like when you don't have an answer and people want to have answers that they just can't seem to have, they want to have some sort of understanding of that, you know? And so even if it means like blaming the wrong person or, you know, not speaking to like the, you know, the other side or whatever you want to call it, it's like, at least they have some sort of answer for them to make themselves feel better. I don't think that that's right because both families are going through the same thing. And if anything, they really should come together and be like, wow, you know, we're all going through this together. This really sucks. Like, let's hold each other through this instead of blaming the other people when you don't even know, like, you don't know, you're just, you're, you're speculating at this point, you have no idea and you're just blaming. And that doesn't, that doesn't help anyone in my opinion. That's very, yeah, that's very true. I think it's kind of human nature, right? Because if you think of, think of the person, think of somebody you love, if something were to happen to them with somebody else that you don't know very well, Mm -hmm. you know, your mind is going to go to, well, my, you know, my person doesn't, isn't involved in anything and they're a good Mm -hmm. person. And you know, you trust them, you know what their life is, but Mm -hmm. you don't know this. It's the unknown. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Like, you know, them doing that, like you were saying, it's very much like human nature, but that doesn't mean that we can't, I don't want to say like go against that, but kind of doing the hard thing and not, I don't know what is like the best way to say this, but just not be ugly to each other, you know, like, and I think that on like a broader scale, kind of like the way that the world is going right now, or like this country is going in terms of how people see each other based on like politics or the virus or whatever, you know what I mean? Like people just have a way of finding blame on the quote unquote other side, you know? When they should be on the same side. Exactly. Exactly. It's like when you guys are all going through the same thing, like you, you really should be holding each other um, through it, not against each other. A case like this uh, will, will be solved you know, you know, by somebody in, in jail, somebody who wants to, you know, for an example, somebody in jail who wants to uh, either clear their conscience, you know, before they, they meet their maker, or, uh, you know, has some specific information that they can, you know, call in. This is still a very... Uh, uh, very much in, in the uh, interest of the FBI to bring closure to this. That's so yeah, crazy. that's it. I mean, the way that the, the FBI is talking, it, it really does just sound like, like they probably have a good guess or a good inkling of what, of like what happened. They just mm-hmm. are missing they're missing what they need to actually move on an arrest or something, you know? Yeah. That's the sense I get. Same here. That's just like you said too. Yeah. So, yeah. Damn. Well, I hope that that happens soon. How crazy would it be? Like, you know, if they actually were able to find whatever the missing piece is, glue it, able to glue it together and then Mm -hmm. close the case. There, like there's no closure, you know, like if someone close to you is gone, like, you know, and, you, but you have no idea how gone they are. Like that's, that leaves an emptiness. Yeah. And a void in you, you know, and as, like that's as not, much as exactly. I was just saying as much and as much as like, you know, they wouldn't leave you, you know, they wouldn't just run right. off. As much right. as you, as much as you know that you still are like you. Pro- I'm. I'm just obviously this has never happened to me, but I'm just uh, guessing. But I, it has to be terrible because mm-hmm. you're holding. You're probably holding on to each little bit of hope you can because you don't have proof that they're dead. Right. Exactly. I mean, do I think they're probably deceased? Yes, I do too. At this point, 
Right. I, I do believe that. But at the same time, you don't know because you haven't seen it with your own eyes. And so when you, if you love somebody that much and you care about somebody that much, I mean, I think it's human nature. You're going to want to cling to the possibility that, you know, maybe. Right. But. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, well, this, thank you again for doing this with me. Yeah. If you are unfamiliar with Joanne, as I mentioned earlier, she is a returning guest. You were on episode number 13, and we talked about three odd mysteries, like real weird, bizarre things that have occurred. Nothing, none of it was sinister, though, I don't think. No, because I, I remember I was like, nothing sinister. I don't really... <laughs> We talked about we talked about the uh, the hijacking of the Chicago TV station. Uh huh. Max Headroom intrusion. Mm -hmm. We talked about the um, the stones that were being thrown at or raining down upon homes in England. Uh huh. And then we talked about um, Captain Coochie's key lime pies. That's right. So. Yep. That was episode 13. If you'd like to hear more of Joanne, episode 13. Um, but thanks again. This is, like I said, this is one of my, quote, favorite cases, just because it's so fascinating. But It is very fascinating. It really is. Thank you for yeah. sharing this with me. You're Anytime. Like, you're like, you know, I mean, I'm personally, I, I definitely don't do the kind of research like you do when it comes to things like this. Mm -hmm. So it's always fun for me to just have you as that person who would like tell me about these things. <laughs> well, the, you know what? The invitation is always open because I, <laughs> I, I literally will in my spare time, just spend so much time looking at stuff like this. And there are crazy things that happen all the time. So I hope you'll be a guest again, but um, yeah, yeah. I definitely will. This was, this was good. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> the clips that you heard on today's show are from 6ABC, a report from anchor Sarah Bloomquist and producer Jessica Gonzalez. They spent a month researching the baffling missing persons case of Danielle Imbo and Richard Patron. If you're interested in watching their full report, we'll have a link to it in the description. Thanks for joining and have a great day. This podcast has been approved by Skipper the Cat. Right, Skippy?